we were uh, discussing about the oxide formation in the flames and um, we have um, discussed that spinal types of uh, the type MeO metal oxide Me2O3 that is uh, metal dioxide <coughs> and uh, of perovskites MeO MeO2 type they form very stable lattices. The examples include the metals such as titanium, zirconium, hafnium, molybdenum etcetera. And uh, in all these cases the signal depression occurs if the salts are of the type of sulphates which gives maximum signal depression compared to chlorides and that is uh, much more than nitrates. So, the formation of carbides also follows a similar series that is fourth group elements um, are uh, you know they give you still smaller uh, signal depression compared to the sixth group uh, fifth group and that is much more than fourth group that is uh, valency 4. If the metal oxide is more volatile than the metal or the carbide usually signal enhancement occurs. So, we will uh, discuss now about vapor phase interferences. The equilibrium and incomplete conversion of the analyte into spectroscopically active form that is in atoms resulting in the attenuation of the signal may be considered as vapor phase interference. First of all we have to remember that the metal atoms formed they need to get into vapor phase uh, system also. So, the equilibrium and incomplete conversion are the only factors that can change the concentration of the atoms in the vapor phase. So, such alterations usually occur in the primary reaction zone. So, diatomic and triatomic compounds such as sodium hydroxide, barium hydroxide, barium oxide, cyanides, oxides they such compounds are uh, readily formed in the flame and they can alter the degree of ionization markedly. So, this is another type of vapor phase interference usually dissociation processes take place between the chemical species and the flame gases. Variation in the concentration of the halides free air radicals oxygen and OH radicals cyanogen radicals hydrogen it is all these gases are uh, there present in the uh, flame of the atomic absorption. So, their presence in the flame gases can influence the dissociation equilibria usually we expect this kind of reactions that is metal oxide reacting with carbon monoxide giving you metal plus CO2 metal oxide reacting with carbon to give you metal and carbon monoxide plus carbon and carbon monoxide can also react with oxygen to form CO2. Cyanogen can uh, pick up an uh, electron from the flame to form cyanide ion and CHO radical can change over to CH plus and O. These ions if they form they can readily suppress the ionization of the analyte. So, that means the signal will become smaller that is it gets attenuated and then we have other types of interferences that is spatial distribution of the interferences. These interferences are caused by the changes in the flow rate of or flow pattern of the sample in the flame. The quantities of combustion products can change the mass flow rate or flow pattern which in turn are influenced by the size and rate of volatilization of the particulates. Examples of this type include signal enhancement of aluminum, barium, calcium, lithium, strontium etcetera. So, the in general several types of interferences can occur in flame AAS due to several factors. Therefore, even in the absence of specificity still signal enhancement or attenuation can occur. This is what we have to understand 
in atomic absorption that is even though it is an element specific technique the signal attenuation can occur due to various reasons that we have discussed so far. We will discuss again the actual chemical reactions that take place with specific metal ions in the uh, later stages. Now, the back, let us discuss about the background correction of um, flame AAS. So, the whenever there is signal uh, attenuation, the background correction also becomes very important because we will have to keep on adjusting the background depending upon the uh, level of attenuation. Therefore, most of the spectral interferences if they are there and all other types of interferences result in the attenuation of the AS signal to some extent. In general, attenuation varies from negligible to several percent depending upon the matrix. So, if you are having um, very pure uh, samples, standards, etcetera, where the matrix elements are much less that is other types of elements which in which you are not interested as an analyte are much less, then the attenuation becomes much less. So, the signal is uh, more commonly uh, known as background absorption when there is no absorption, uh, no matrix elements. That is suppose you use aqueous solutions only containing only one analyte or two analytes, then there is um, whatever signal you get without the sample is known as background absorption, which can be easily estimated by aspiring a closely matching reference solution or blank, uh, we call it as blank and it becomes uh, fairly important to run a blank in almost every determination. So, the absorbance of the reference or the blank must be subtracted from that of the calibration curve <coughs> as well as the samples. So, alternately what you can do radiation from the deuterium lamp can be measured at the resonance wavelength only and to determine the background absorption because the uh, radiation from the continuum is almost represented by the deuterium lamp which is used for background uh, so this thing. So, a schematic representation of a deuterium lamp background character can be measured at the reference wavelength to determine the background absorption. This is the figure of uh, uh, a background correction unit in atomic absorption. So, I want you to uh, see this figure. <coughs> Here, what I have is an analyte hollow cathode lamp that is the source and here I have a deuterium lamp, signals come from each side and then there is a rotating chopper, both beams are combined and then pass through the flame and again they will be separated and then they lead to the monochromator. This is the schematic arrangement and uh, uh, in this figure the exit slit of the monochromator separates the resonance line from the emission spectrum of the hollow cathode lamp equivalent to band pass width of about 0 0.2 to 0 0.7 nanometer. This is th this number 0 0.2 to 0 0.7 represents the actual slit width in the atomic absorption instrument which you can set manually or um, it, uh, you can change it uh, automatically. The intensity I p s of the primary source is equalized to the intensity I c s, c s means continuum source. So, the primary source that is hollow cathode lamp intensity I p s is equalized to ICS before the determination. So, that IPS to ICS ratio is unity. This is very important for us to uh, standardize the measurements. So, for normal measurements what we do is we measure the usually less than 1 percent absorption 
um, if the background concentrate background absorbance is less than 1 percent, we can neglect that that is ICS that is continuum source. If the absorption of the reference solution is less than 1 percent, you can neglect at higher absorbance the signal from the hollow cathode lamp is attenuated proportionally to the concentration of the analyte in this case. So, in effect ICS that is continuum source of the radiation serves as a reference beam. So, this is how the signal works. For example, here I have a primary source, this is a slit and then here it is a continuum source same slit and then IPS and ICS are equalized in height. And then we have atomic absorption signal IPS is greater than ICS. So, the emission absorption occurs in this um, signal making a small gap here in the third figure. And then the IPS and ICS are equalized again and then the atomic absorption occurs that is IPS is less than ICS. So, we have a an atomic absorption signal that is this is how the mechanism of uh, background correction works. And so, background correction it will work provided the continuum sources are less than 0.5 absorbance. If it is very high, then this technique will not work. Further, suppose it is very high, then what happens? The noise also increases by a factor of 2 or 3. So, against this, we generally go for measurement with um, low background. That is, the solutions should be as less as possible. Uh, in terms of complex complexity. That means, it should not uh, you should not be determining the samples in very so high salt water content uh, such as body fluids or urine or sea water or several other alloys etcetera. So, another way of uh, background correction is Zeeman effect background correction. So, let us discuss a little more about the Zeeman effect uh, background correction. So, the basic theory is very simple when an atomic vapor is placed in a magnetic field of the order of about 10 kilo gauss, the energy levels split or terms split which manifests as spectral line splitting. In the simplest case, the spectral line split into three components, one is sigma component and other is pi component. So, pi component occurs at the exactly the same frequency as the original signal and sigma components are separated slightly to the left and right of the pi component the components are of the order of about the separation of the sigma components are of the order of about 0 0.01 nanometer. So, if the energy level split, the energy also is split automatically and the ratio of sigma uh, plus and sigma minus 2 pi corresponds to approximately 25 to 50 is to 25 that is pi component is maximum with 50 percent and the one which shifts to the left is uh, about 25 percent in intensity and which shifts to the right is also approximately 25 percent in intensity. That means, if the separation occurs only between um, sigma plus and sigma minus and pi components, you get three peaks in the presence of magnetic field and this is known as Zeeman effect. Now, simultaneously when you place a magnet in from on the atomic cloud, the terms get 
uh, split into three components, but simultaneously the radiation also is polarized. That means, the, um, the direction changes of the the direction of the radiation also changes. So, the extent of polarization direction change of direction depends upon the direction of the magnetic field. So, higher the magnetic field more is the rotation. Some elements split into only three components just like I was telling you and this is known as normal Zeeman splitting. Elements such as barium, calcium, beryllium, calcium, magnesium, mercury, lead etcetera, they lay, um, uh, exhibit normal Zeeman effect splitting. Some elements split into more components and uh, but odd numbers. Some elements split into more even number of components. These are uh, sort of anomaly uh, because uh, the normal is only three components. So, when there are more components, the effect is known as anomalous Zeeman splitting. This kind of splitting can be used in atomic absorption measurement for background correction. How? It is very simple. <coughs> Here I am showing you the normal splitting that is the central component here is the pi component and here are two sigma component one is sigma minus another is sigma plus. So, the elements corresponding to this are barium, beryllium, calcium, cadmium, mercury etcetera, magnesium etcetera. Here are anomalous uh, uh, examples of anomalous Zeeman effect. Here you can see that there are more number of pi components, more number of sigma components also. Here you can see again pi component is missing, but uh, there are uh, equal number of uh, sigma components. Uh, the elements correspond showing this type of pattern of splitting are aluminum, arsenic, beryllium uh, and then bismuth, antimony etcetera. And all in all most of the elements what I have listed here, they are about 35 elements which will show you different kinds of uh, the splitting, Zeeman splitting and uh, this effect we can use it for background correction. So, if the magnetic field is applied at right angles to the radiation beam that is <coughs> the radiation beam is going like this, I am going to put the magnetic field like this one at the top, one at the bottom so, the radiation is going in between these two magnetic fields. So, that is a pi component is in such case pi component is polarized perpendicular to the applied field. That means, it is uh, mm, rotated by 90 degrees. So, this configuration is known as transverse Zeeman effect. So, when the magnetic field is parallel to the radiation beam, then it is called as longitudinal Zeeman effect. In this configuration, pi component is totally missing and only two sigma components you will be see, seeing and be, both of them would be having approximately 50 percent of the intensity because the pi component is missing. So, the total of sigma plus and sigma minus would be 50 percent. Now, this is a schematic uh, representation of the Zeeman effect. This figure tells you that uh, the atom cloud, how it can affect the signal. Now, the in the center you will see there is an atom cloud here, there is no magnetic field. When there is no magnetic field, I get a signal at mu 0 which is approximately this height. Now, if I apply the field perpendicular to the direction of the beam, here is the direction of the beam and um, 
then what happens I have a transverse Zeeman effect the uh, this is pi component this is sigma minus and this is sigma plus. So, in longitudinal how I am going to apply the field put the magnet on the top and bottom and uh, this is the magnetic field direction. So, in this case pi component is rotated out of the out of the beam and you will see only sigma plus and sigma minus uh, peaks. So, this effect can be suppose you put a magnet like this and measure the absorbance when the magnet is on you will be measuring only the whatever signal you get will be the background because the metal uh, uh, atoms uh, signal sigma plus and sigma minus are already shifted away. So, what you see would be the pi and pi um, component is missing because it is already rotated 90 degrees. So, what you would be measuring is whatever signal you get is only the sigma component. So, when the magnetic field is applied to the radiation source. Now, in the previous figure I have shown you that uh, this is the atom cloud on which the magnetic field has been applied. Now, what we want to do is suppose we apply it to the source that is hollow cathode lamp itself. <coughs> then uh, it is known as direct Zeeman effect. The magnetic field also can be applied to atomic cloud as we have seen earlier. This is known as inverse Zeeman effect. So, in the inverse Zeeman effect the energy levels of the absorbing atoms are split and the absorbance values also change since sigma components are rotated out of the radiation line and only pi component absorbs which can be measured. For the direct Zeeman effect absorption can be measured at both sigma and pi component wavelengths also. So, a number of possibilities exist in which we can organize the Zeeman if application of the magnetic field um, to the either to the atomic cloud or to the source of radiation that is hollow cathode lamp. So, if a magnetic field is applied by permanent magnet or by a direct current a rotating polarizer must be applied to measure the total epsilon because when you apply ma permanent magnetic field it is already rotated. So, you have to re-rotate it back to measure the absorbance. So, by apply suppose you apply alternating current then alternating magnetic field is generated which splits the energy levels only when the field is on. So, you will have a continuous on off on off uh, magnetic field. So, if you look at all these possibilities there are 8 possible configurations of application of Zeeman uh, effect background. Uh, for example, here you can see that the we have a at the suppose I apply to the radiation source that is on the hollow cathode lamp. I can orient the magnetic field parallel that is longitudinal or perpendicular to the radiation source. Then I can apply constant field or alternating field. So, rotating if I apply constant field I need a rotating polarizer. If I apply alternating field then there is no polarizer required. Similarly, we have suppose I do it with transverse um, magnetic field then again I have a constant and alternating, but I need a rotating polarizer and fixed polarizer for the uh, for measuring the signal. So, suppose I apply the field magnetic field at the atomizer that is atomic cloud then again I have parallel and perpendicular uh, positions I can use constant magnet or alternating magnetic field then uh, of course, uh, this is not applicable because uh, to a flame you cannot apply constant uh, magnetic field but uh, to the alternating field you can apply 
So, no polarizer required. So, perpendicular transverse arrangement gives me a rotating polarizer and fixed polarizer. So, in all these cases it is possible to measure. Now, in atomic absorption instruments inverse Zeeman effect that is magnet at the atomizer are preferable compared to a source. So, what we would like to do is around the flame we can put a magnet without touching the magnet, but keeping the field on at the same time. In that case a rotating require is required if a constant magnet is used. Therefore, alternating magnetic field is used because it does not require a um, require a rotating polarizer also. So, the addition of a rotating polarizer puts further restrictions of uh, the uh, servo mechanism to rotate the field or non rotate de, de rotate the um, etcetera. In this case configuration absorbance is measured with field off that is when the field is off you are measuring total absorbance that is normal AS and with field is on when the field is on the sigma components are shifted pi component is rotated. So, there is nothing at the uh, at the measurement wavelength and you will be measuring only the background. So, this is a true double beam technique since both beams originate from the same source. Usually measurements are made at the same frequency therefore, they follow the same optical path and they fall on the same detector only difference is once we are measuring the total absorbance once we are measuring the total background. So, the sensitivity remains unaltered and background gets corrected. This is the beauty of Zeeman atomic absorption and uh, several commercial instruments are available with this type of arrangement. And uh, another one is new way of measuring the absorbance that is background correction is known as Smith Hiff J background correction technique and this method is based on the self absorption behavior of the radiation emitted by the hollow cathode lamps when they are operated at high currents. Now, I have referred to this self absorption earlier um, in my introductory remarks and um, I have also mentioned that several of the street lights what you see sodium in sodium vapor lamps uh, in the streets they switch on and off as if somebody is uh, switching uh, with a button you know so on off, but actually it is not so because the at high currents the atomic cloud increases uh, of uh, atomic cloud of the sodium increases and it absorbs all the radiation emitted by the sodium vapor lamp. So, this principle is used in the background correction. What happens? Application of high current produces large concentration of the unexcited atoms in the hollow cathode lamp itself. So, the these atoms are capable of absorbing the radiation wherever you produce either in the flame or in the lamp if there are unexcited atoms they would be absorbing the radiation. So, suppose you increase the concentration of the unexcited atoms in the hollow cathode lamp itself, then the hollow cathode lamp itself will absorb all the radiation and no radiation will pass through the optics flame and the atomic cloud and reach the detector. This is the principle. Now, what happens? These atoms are capable of absorbing radiation produced from the excited atomic species and high currents also broaden the emission lines of the excited species. Net effect is to produce a line that has a minimum at its center that is the resonance line. So, at the resonance line when complete absorption takes place there is no absorbance and only background gets measured. So, what we have to do is to operate the hollow cathode lamp 
alternately with high current, low current, high current and low current like that if we are able to do and measure then the atomic absorption usually uh, is uh, can be measured with good background correction. This is known as smith hiff j correction. I will show you a figure shortly corresponding to this. To obtain the corrected absorbances, the lamp must be programmed to run alternately at normal current and high current in quick succession at the rate of every 5 milliseconds. 5 milliseconds you take one measurement and then apply high current, no absorbance, only background gets measured, again apply low current like that. If you keep on doing every 5 milliseconds, then you can collect the uh, all the background uh, um, measurements for about 1 second or something like that, add all of them, then add the signal without um, uh, high current that will give you background plus the atomic uh, absorption signal. So, if you subtract the two, what you will be getting is the normal atomic absorption signal which is corrected for the background. And uh, during the um, first part, background and atomic absorption is measured and during the second part, only absorption peak is at the minimum and only the background is measured. So, the data acquisition system must be there to subtract the two signals to give a this thing. So, if you take a look at this figure, this is a, what I have discussed so far, it becomes fairly clear that is when uh, at low current, this is the atomic absorption signal. At uh, high current, the signal gets submerged and only the what you will be measuring is only the difference that is there is no atomic absorption at all. And um, this is the mechanism of uh, atomic absorption. So, you can either use uh, even uh, uh, the um, nowadays instruments are available which will give you the an instrument which is automatically fitted with uh, smith hiff j correction method that is to supply electric current to the hollow cathode lamp alternately and um, such instruments are available in the market one can definitely go and choose between the, all the three all the that is deuterium background correction zeeman effect background correction or Smith FJ background career. All the systems are available and uh, uh, one has to evaluate critically what are the requirements of an analytical uh, method and then go for the uh, most suitable background correction system. I will be listing out the effects the advantages and disadvantages of such background correction in the coming slides. So, uh, what I want to do now is I want to discuss with you the chemical reactions in atomic absorption spectrometry. So, um, in, in the light of the background correction, how we can evaluate the chemical reactions and the types of interferences also. Earlier we have discussed solute vaporization etcetera and vapor phase uh, inter, uh, interference etcetera. But in theory, atomic absorption spectrometry is an element specific technique that means there should not be any doubt regarding the presence of an element if you get an AS signal. At the same time, it is element specific that means, no other elements will interfere. Now, because of the chemical reactions in atomic absorption uh, flame, we will have interferences. So, any analytical instrumental technique however sensitive, simple and rapid, it is not free from all interference. This point I want to stress again and again that 
no instrumental technique is ever interference free. So, as analytical scientists, we must be aware of the origin and source of such interferences to provide accurate analytical results and uh, precise results also. So, atomic absorption spectrometer is one such analytical instrument and it has got inherent interferences from the sample introduction stages to the detector. Sometimes even contamination during the preparation of the sample itself may occur. And then originally it was thought that AAS is basically free from all uh, interferences as we measure only very narrow resonance lines from the hollow cathode lamp, but um, uh, it is actually not so. So, the um, interferences in chemical terms and physical terms we can classify like this that is um, first is physical interferences, chemical interferences, ionization interferences, then we have spectral interferences we have discussed this a little bit earlier and then non specific interferences. So, the physical interference normally occurs at the sample introduction stage and the remaining chemical ionization etcetera they is the first one occurs at the sample introduction stage and all the other four occur during their stay in the flame. So, with this we will not discuss physical interferences because uh, we have already discussed the different types of uh, uh, interferences that is due to viscosity and then transport and all these things. But what I want to stress at this stage is that the transport and other uh, aerosol effects etcetera they all they affect all the instruments equally. So, the signal gets attenuated, but you cannot really call it a an interference, but attenuation all the same. So, they constitute interferences not specific to particular element this point we will have to remember. Now, the physical processes that occur during nebulization they have large influence on the sensitivity and selectivity of the flame methods. The nebulization efficiency depends upon the nature of the nebulizing gas and the sample solvent. The variation in the viscosity, surface tension, density and temperature of the sample all these things interfere in the nebulization process and therefore, they affect the sensitivity. This interference can be controlled to some extent by the preparation of standard solutions used to construct the calibration curve under similar physical conditions of the solvent of the sample. So, these interferences can be eliminated by diluting the sample solutions also or by the method of standard addition. These things we will discuss uh, later about the analytical techniques of uh, uh, analytical methodology, how we go about doing this uh, standard addition and other uh, techniques. Now, the presence of high concentration of dissolved salts for example, it can reduce an analytical signal. It also leads to formation and incrustation of the nebulizer and the burner head you know burner head is a basically a small uh, mag small uh, metallic piece with several slots and if the salts are there they can block the gas passage so if it blocks the gas passage you will not be getting the signal at all so in general it can be said that physical interferences can result if the sample and the standard solution vary in bulk composition. 
the normal sample solution uptake in atomic absorption is about 6 to 7 milliliters per minute and the nebulization efficiency is of the order of about 10 percent. Maximum nowadays it is uh, uh, about 13 to 15 percent not more than that. That means, only 15 percent of the 6 to 7 ml of the sample gets into the flame as aerosol. So, any change in these normal values causes physical interference and uh, this can lead to spurious uh, signals also. So, I do not want to say more about uh, physical interferences because all these things are common to all elements. Therefore, good maintenance of atomic absorption should take care of such interferences. Now, let us talk about chemical interferences. We have already explained that uh, the physical interferences occur from sample int introduction stage before nebulization until it reaches the burner. Now, once the burner the sample reaches the burner then all types of chemical reactions can occur. This we also we have discussed earlier with the uh, flame uh, component reactions. You remember uh, that uh, I want to go back uh, to the slide what I had shown you today only. If you could uh, look at this, these are some of the reactions we had discussed earlier metal oxide etcetera, but these are all general terms that is M is repre M represents only a metal and C O, C 2, oxygen, electrons these are all, all these things represent the flame components. So, now we will discuss a little more about uh, the chemical interferences in specific because uh, I, we feel that uh, it is possible to uh, know the reactions much more uh, thoroughly if we understand the processes. So, the schematic diagram again I had shown you this figure earlier that uh, metal has to get evaporated it must form a um, uh, solution and it must form an aerosol then it forms a solid aerosol then it comes to gaseous form and then uh, metal atoms and then metal atoms can form oxides and then uh, as they can get excited they can form um, react with the carbide carbon to form carbides etcetera and uh, this reaction this we have seen uh, earlier and discussed also. So, the sample solution first enters the nebulization where it gets fragmented etcetera the bigger size droplets fall into the collection system and uh, they get lost to drains and smaller 10 percent goes to the atmosphere goes into the spray chamber and then enters this thing enters the burner and um, the it is uh, the free metals undergo a variety of reactions like oxygen, hydrogen, carbon etcetera and uh, the uh, to get optimum sensitivity we need the metal atom concentrations. So, chemical interferences are the most common interferences encountered in the atomic absorption spectroscopy. If the sample enters um, a thermally forms a thermally stable compound then the dissociation of the metal into atoms does not occur. This is a very simple straightforward interpretation of the interference in the atomic absorption. So, if the signal gets attenuated we have a chemical interference. So, chemical interference can either enhance a signal or attenuate the signal also. Now, let us take an example of calcium chloride. Now, the in this slide I am going to show you the uh, calcium as an example what happens to the solution. Suppose, I start with calcium in solution I can represent it as calcium chloride CaCl 2 
n h 2 o n number of water molecules that is in solution. Now, it must form a liquid gas aerosol of calcium chloride n h 2 o and upon uh, heating it, it must form solid. So, the water molecules will evaporate and I have only calcium chloride here and then the it must melt dissociate calcium chloride will form and calcium atoms will form and then chlorine atoms and this calcium atom form can form excited can get excited and then ionized or recombine to form molecules. So, these are the uh, waste techniques because uh, only the excitation is the one process where the atomic absorption can occur, but ionization and recombination are not conducive to good atomic absorption. So, what are the types of the reactions? Here it is C A 0 calcium atom and chlorine and uh, it can also react with the acid present in the solution to form calcium atoms and 2 H C L that is hydrochloric acid in the flame. All these reactions are occurring in the flame. So, you can see that calcium oxide suppose it forms because there is air in the flame also and calcium oxide can, can get converted to calcium atom and oxygen atoms. So, when it is present as calcium nitrate then we can expect nitrogenous gases. For example, I have written here that calcium nitrate C A N O 3 twice 3 H 2 O gets dissociated into oxide calcium oxide plus N O 2 nitric oxide nitrogen dioxide plus 3 water molecules. So, if we do this calcium oxide uh, can again decompose to calcium atoms and oxygen. So, I have shown you two types of reactions in which calcium chloride or calcium nitrate may be present as the analyte. So, in chloride medium it forms calcium atoms and chlorine atoms and uh, the uh, in nitric acid medium it forms calcium oxide that is the mechanism. In chloride medium it forms straight away dissociates into calcium atoms. In any acid nitric acid medium that is an oxidant it gets converted to oxides and then it decomposes. So, it is a two stage process. <coughs> so, as explained earlier the most common chemical interference is the compound formation. So, most of the elements in the alkaline earth elements such as beryllium, calcium, strontium, barium etcetera, they form highly refractory metal oxides in the flame resulting in the loss of these metal atoms available for atomic absorption. Because if they form the compounds they are lost to the atomic absorption. So, the dissociation of the metal oxides back into free atoms uh, depends upon the temperature of the flame. If the temperature of the flame is very high then decomposition can always occur. The higher the temperature of the flame the more is the dissociation and hence better sensitivity. So, it is a very simple logic that if a compound forms in the flame then we have to raise the temperature of the flame to get the atoms back. So, the air acetylene gives a temperature of about 2300 to 2600 degree centigrade that is depending upon the composition of the acetylene as well as air mixtures. Now, at this temperature most of the metal oxides dissociate except refractory elements like alkali alkaline earth elements also to some extent niobium, tantalum, aluminum, zirconium etcetera they form refractory oxides. 
So, a flame which gives a temperature higher than air acetylene that is 2600 degree is required. If your sample contains any of the elements like neobium, tantalum, uh, aluminum, zirconium etcetera. Now, this is how do you get this higher temperature? Suppose you want to analyze neobium only, air acetylene will not work, it will give you a very less sensitivity. So, change over to nitrous oxide gas that we know that nitrous oxide gives you higher temperature up to 2900 degree centigrade. So, normally the elements whose dissociation energy is more than 5.0 volts, they cannot be determined by air acetylene. This is a very simple logic and a guideline for us. So, if the dissociation energy is more than 5 volts, you need air acetylene, um, you, do, you do not need air acetylene, but what you need is nitrous oxide acetylene gas. It is not always the temperature of the flame that is important, we have to understand this effect, because uh, it is not always the temperature. Many times the carbon oxygen ratio in the flame also determines the sensitivity, not only the high temperature, but you have to adjust the carbon oxygen. So, if you have a reducing flame that is a reddish flame, uh, now uh, if you have a reddish flame that is uh, oxidizing, then you may get higher temperature even with the air acetylene also, but there are always limitations of up to maximum you could get is around 2600 uh, degrees but higher than that you have to go for no amount of you have to go for nitrous oxide acetylene, but no amount of flow ratio of acetylene and nitrous oxide will change the temperature to the desired level. So, a reducing flame providing more fuel than the stoichiometric requirement is desirable for refractory metal oxides. So, one should only optimize the flame conditions in the fuel to oxidant ratio, height etcetera to get maximum sensitivity. In our laboratory, we have tried some investigations using sugar to alter the carbon oxygen ratio in the flame in the flame for fa favorable for atomization because it is very simple to use sugar along because sugar dissolves in uh, water or uh, acids to a large extent. And when you introduce sugar into the flame, obviously most of the sugar components will get decomposed into carbon atoms. So, this is one way of adjusting the carbon component also in the flame by just by introducing the sugar. And we have observed that for elements like molybdenum, titanium, uh, vanadium, aluminum, barium, yttrium, dysprosium, holmium etcetera, there is enhancement in the absorbance values, while there is no enhancement in the case of less refractory elements like copper, cadmium, cobalt etcetera. A very, this is a very interesting observation, because when we introduce sugar, there is large amount of car carbon atoms in the flame and they give you enhanced signal for refractory oxides that is molybdenum, vanadium, titanium, aluminum all these form refractory oxides. The, what do we mean by refractory oxides is very stable oxides which are having which are stable up to 3000 degree centigrade etcetera. Now, such elements give you higher signal when we put sugar, but when we do not put sugar, we, uh, we have problems um, with ordinary elements like copper, cadmium, cobalt, nickel etcetera. Now, it is very funny because why there should not be a signal enhancement when we put sugar along with the solution. The answer is very simple. Then, uh, 
with the even without sugar the dissociation of the salts is complete in the case of copper cadmium cobalt and nickel so any amount of addition of sugar is not going to increase the concentration because the dissociation is complete but in the case of refractory oxides we always get an enhancement in the signal because the refractory oxides start decomposing when we put sugar because of the reducing atmosphere that is in addition to the gas and nitrous oxide flame. So, the other type of compound formation is also possible where the elements can form refractory phosphates and double oxides in the flame for example, aluminum, silicon etcetera, strontium they react with uh, um, aluminum or silicon and forms refractory oxides such as SrOAL2O3 strontium oxide aluminum oxide compound and then SrOSiO2 strontium oxide silicon dioxide compounds. Similarly, with phosphate we have calcium phosphate during the evaporation of the liquid droplets in the flame. This compound is converted into calcium pyrophosphate with heat and is very stable in the air acetylene flame. For the sake of brevity, I want you to read this slide uh, uh, to get the ideas clear because uh, in most of the systems we do have a we do have a situation where refractory oxides give you higher signal when sucrose is, is added and normal elements do not give you sucrose uh, higher significant higher signal. So, we will continue our discussion in the next class.